Welcome back. Well, you'll have seen the huge the looting and the violence that took place here two weeks ago, but it seems that there are protests and riots and what you could call social change around the world taking place at the moment. Some of this is linked to COVID-19. Some of it will be linked to other dynamics. For some people with longer memories or people who are just as old as I am, uh, it may in fact remind us of what happened towards the very end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Iron Curtain, the beginnings of democracy in South Africa, all of them linked to each other. Graham Codrington is the futurist. He joins us now. Graham, good afternoon to you. We saw violence in South Africa. We're seeing agitation for social change and social justice. Is this similar to what's happening in other places around the world? You know, Stephen, I think you framed this uh, so well. Uh, as South Africans, uh, we obviously, we, we have a unique country as everybody does, but we tend to forget that we live in the world and we live in a context. Uh, we, uh, exactly as you've just said, we forgot about that back at the end of the 1980s. You know, Mandela was released from jail on the 11th of February, 1990. We forget that a few weeks earlier than that, Mikhail Gorbachev had banned the Communist Party in Russia and announced perestroika. That was Boxing Day of 1989. A few weeks before that, the Berlin Wall had come down. That was the 9th of November, 1989. A few weeks before that, there had been uprisings in different parts of uh, Eastern Europe, especially Estonia was a big one. Uh, a few weeks before that, the Ayatollah had died in Iran, and there were massive riots on the streets of Tehran. That was the 6th of June, 1989. And the day before that, on the 5th of June, 1989, was Tiananmen Square, the students protesting in front of the tanks in China. So that's six months of human history, and we as South Africans were just on the end of that, seeing our change come. We forget that the world changes together and that there are these big trends in place. You know, my, my job is to think about the future, but actually we learn so much from history when we remember it. And I think we're in one of those moments again right now. I mean, there are links. If you, if you just look at conversations that we have now around the demands for social justice, I mean, there's a link to my mind at least, between the Black Lives Matter protests, the election of Donald Trump four years before that, I'm talking about the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States, the election of Donald Trump, and then younger people claiming, I suppose, their own agency. I'm talking about someone like Naomi Osaka or Pauline Bowles, actually standing up and saying, this is how I feel, and this is what I'm gonna do about it. I'm going to withdraw from this competition, or whatever it is, to protect myself. Yeah. People, young, people are, being assertive in their quest for social justice, and this is all linked. And, you know, young people are leading that cause. So let's add in climate activism in the name of Greta Thunberg and others who are doing similar things all around the world. But let, let's get back to your initial question as well about the recent violence uh, here in South Africa. People forget that just a few months ago, we were watching scenes in the United States of America. And I'm, I'm going back earlier than the storming of the Capitol on the 6th of January this year. A few months before that, linked to Black Lives Matter and, uh, and other issues was Portland, uh, Seattle, and a few other places where the Donald Trump sent the American military in using tear gas and, uh, you know, we, we saw tanks on the streets in America um, as the military kind of engaged with protests and, and in Portland in particular, there were months of, of protest uh, against the government. Um, and it wasn't all related to COVID. A lot of it is related to a big era shift that is taking place. Right now, there are protests around the world. Some, as you said, were, are related to COVID. But most of them are related to people being unhappy with their government, unhappy with the situation they find themselves in. And uh, there are nearly 50 countries in the world right now that have active uh, protests and riots. Um, and they're not just the usual suspects, you know. Haiti had their uh, president assassinated uh, just two or three weeks ago. Uh, but it's, it's France and Greece just in the last few days. It's Turkey and India and Hong Kong in a few days before that. It's Australia uh, two days ago. That, that was a COVID one. Um, and they, they haven't had much to do with COVID uh, in Australia. But still, thousands of people out on the street saying our government is not doing the right thing. And I think it, 
it's no consolation if, if you're a business person and, and your store was looted two weeks ago and burnt down. But it's helpful context for us to understand that we in South Africa are part of a global move for big societal and political change. Um, so it leads to a very complicated question, Graham, which is what will the world look like after this? And to use the examples from Tiananmen Square halfway through 1989 all the way to, let's just say for argument's sake, the, the release of Nelson Mandela, that six-month period. The period after that in this country saw negotiations and then a period of relative peace and a growing economy. The the, the, that same period saw the same actually in much of the world. We had election after election on our continent in Africa. There was a process of, I suppose I would call it partial democratization. Uh, I mean, let me just use that phrase for the moment. We saw Europe growing yeah. richer. We saw the United States growing much richer and the seeds of the inequality we see now being laid. But it was, by and large, relative to what happened before and what's happened since, it was a period of calm, stability and economic growth. Are you optimistic it'll happen again? I sort of am. <laughs> I sort of am as well. Um, it, it, it's a really great question and I don't want to oversimplify the answer, but I actually think the answer might be a bit simple. For the last hundred years, but, but maybe for the last 50 or 60 years in particular, we've had two competing massive ideologies, two big ideologies, capitalism and communism. They've never been applied in their purest forms anywhere in the world. But if we think of them as two big ideologies, they've been fighting it out for a century. And interestingly, South Africa has always been one of the global epicenters, like Cuba has been as a proxy war between that, that's why, you know, the Russians were very interested in us back in the 1980s and 90s, and America was to, you know, Vietnam and Korea were, were another place where that proxy was literally fought out uh, in, in war. And both of those ideologies have failed. Neither, as I say, neither have ever been applied properly, <coughs> but both have proven inadequate. Um, and we are, n and I think, that what maybe started 25 years ago with all of those things we've been talking about has is now building momentum. In other words, I think it's the same story. I think history textbooks will look back and see sort of the late 1980s as the start and where we are now as, I, I don't know, maybe the height of this discontent by people around the world, whether whether you're in Russia or China um, and you're under the communist uh, side of the situation, whether you're in, in, in Europe or, or, or the USA uh, and you're on the capitalistic side, we've got to come up with a new way. We've got to find a new model that takes the best of the, of the models we've tried before, maybe something entirely new uh, that begins to emerge. Um, and it, it's not just a, a halfway compromise model. It has to be a new model that gets, that, that promises us and delivers the promise of a better life for all, of, of everybody living well together in society. And I'm really excited that South Africa could be at the epicenter of us getting this right, working this out. Um, and maybe we'll look back at the riots two weeks ago and say, that was the catalyst that says to, said to us, we can't do this slowly, we can't do this little bit here or there. We've got to make big changes now. And I think if we do that, um, I, I think we'll look back and we'll say that was the turning point and it started to get better after that. I am optimistic. You talk about the sort of contest between what were the two big systems of that era, communism and capitalism. You make the, the very important point, neither applied in their full, uh, perfect, well, perfect, pure form, let me say, rather. Um, uh, let me suggest that what might be the two systems which challenge each other going forward are between open systems and closed systems. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what looked like a failure of an open system but may turn out to be a success. When the, Astra, when the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine was first produced in the United States, the Un Americans were obviously very pleased. I'm sure that the Russians and the Chinese were not. They have competing vaccines, and I think they are competing vaccines. I'll use that phrase. They're complementary, but they're competing too. There's geopolitics here.
Then there were huge problems with one of the plants in Baltimore that had produced the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and that resulted in a big delay for us. But that was also a victory for an open system because we all knew what the problem was, and we all knew when the problem was resolved. I don't know enough about the data of the Sinovac vaccine or the Sputnik vaccine to have the same confidence that I might have in the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because they were honest with the problems because of the way that society works. Are we going to see a contest between open societies and closed societies? It's a fascinating example and a great question. And I, and I think there's probably two or three axes like this. So, you know, one of the axes is definitely open versus closed. And that may be a, a very similar axis between uh, global and national because one of the other things that we've seen, of course, uh, is uh, this vaccine nationalism with uh, countries that have hoarded vaccines or, uh, more correctly, have ordered way more vaccines than they needed in order to bump themselves up the, the delivery uh, uh, pecking order. And that's part of our problem here. Literally today in South Africa, the announcement being made that we are falling below our vaccination targets, not because we... Uh, don't have uh, what we need in terms of vaccination sites and and people to do it. We just don't have supply. Uh, whereas Canada, with their 38 million population, ordered 400 million doses of the vaccine um, so that they uh, could get ahead uh, in the curve. So, you know, that kind of thing is going to be part of the conversation over the next few years as we look at who's really acting and thinking with a global mindset on and, and who's being more nationalistic. And that, as I say, may be very similar to open and closed. Um, and then I, I would say, Stephen, an, another one to have a look at is, and I think this is where the old conservative versus progressive is going, is we're in the midst of a fight for, for free speech and for you know cancel culture on the other side. And, and I think what's really going on there is that we've got we, we, we're working out again in history the balance between individual rights and society rights. Do I have the right to refuse a vaccine, but then still have the right to walk around freely without a mask on in society? We've got to balance individual rights and societal rights. And every now and again, every few years, we, we, we come up against an issue that, that challenges us to, to, make, to have that conversation. And, and I think that that might be part of this equation going forward is do we favor more individual rights, letting people just get on and do whatever they want to do, um, or do we favor more societal rights where we take into account the, uh, the, the, the rights and the inclusion of minorities and, and, and people who are not the majority in the population? So, you know, these are the conversations that we are going to have. And, and I say once again, I think that it's an exciting time and place to be here in South Africa because we will have these conversations. We, we have every reason to have the right conversations and to find the right answers because we know we, we literally two or three weeks ago saw what happens uh, when you ignore the problem and don't have the answers. Graham Codrington, I really appreciate the time. Thank you very much indeed. It's a fascinating conversation, Graham Codrington, of course, the futurist uh, looking at some of the issues that could play out. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to the United Nations representative in South Africa. Also, the SARS Commission, Edward Kiesvetter, uh, is going to talk about alcohol and tax, but also the Tax Relief Act. Stay with us.